like to have you sign it in case you need an alibi or anything so you can take care of that. <laughs> Should be fine.
that's it.
I didn't think it was going to be quite that loud. Okay, so we got... Okay. I told my husband to come sit up here where he could hear. Um, no, he's... He'll, he'll figure out that it's his turn soon. There's a chair, and if you don't like where the chairs are, you can, chair. you can move the chairs. We are very flexible, especially today. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tamara Allen, and I'm the, I have the honor of being the director of the Carabell History Museum. And one of the funnest and the most interesting things we do all year is um, putting on these talks because. There's so many aspects to the history of Carabelle. It's very, um, I always have to relearn every time I hold the mic. Um, it's very complex and colorful in its history, going way back to the prehistoric Indians and all the way up to the present day. There's just a multitude of things that we, um, that we can talk about and so, we are glad to be back here. This is a new season for us. We are very thankful this year to having um, actually have a new sponsor. We have uh, uh, Seaquarters Marina, who's been our sponsor for several years, uh, letting us use this uh, lovely facility. The um, okay, here we are. The uh, the new one this year is. Um, Sunset Isle RV Park and Yacht Club over on, on the island over here in town. And then we have the, um, um, I am just, I probably better look at my list. Some of the rings are like that. I obviously haven't had enough coffee. Okay, so um, it's okay. I was, I was stalling until you got here. Um, <laughs> I knew you were waiting on folks. I thought I'd just go outside and get some air. It's okay. And then I started seeing people I'm talking. Just um, I'm just So we've got Sean Donahoe Real Estate has been a very good long-term sponsor of our talks. And uh, we are glad to have Sunset Isle this year as a new sponsor for our talks. Along with the, tourist, the Franklin County Tourist Development Council. We, we don't do anything without their support. We're thankful for that. Um, this is the first of a series of three to four talks, depending on how the spring goes, the spring series. We have been um, juggling things since COVID happened, and there's been a lot of things we could do and couldn't do, but I think we're back on track for having four sessions this year. That's at least, that's our plan. The other topics that we have on the agenda for, for coming up is, um, in January, we're going to have a, a retalk, a different talk on the shipwrecks of Dog Island. I don't know if any of you were the in the sardine meeting we had here, where we had 
like 300 people jammed in the room, contrary to the, don't tell the fire marshal. Um, we finally had to lock the doors because we couldn't take any more people. But um, the shipwrecks of Dog Island as it relates to the Carabelle history is a fascinating topic because those shipwrecks mostly happened uh, in the hurricane of 1899, which is called the Carabelle Hurricane, and it was a direct hit on Carabelle of a Category 5. So we were like the ground zero, like Mexico Beach was for Michael. And in that particular event, all the um, ships that were in port loading lumber and turpentine went out to Dog Island and anchored to ride out the storm. And in the wreckage that followed, there's an iconic picture of um, that those wrecks. And in that one photograph, there are ships from Russia, Italy, Norway, Great Britain, and North America. So it is just a, just a small indication of what an international port we were. And one of the, we had more international ships in Carabell that year and the next year than any other port in the state of Florida. Now, that's not bad for a town without a traffic you know, it's, <laughs> So we are very proud of, of, the, of the fact that we have the guy, they call him Mr. Dog Island Shipwreck. It's uh, Chuck Mead is gonna be here in January and we're looking forward to his talk and we'll probably have it have an evening talk um, uh, here in this location the first um, during January so we're glad it'll be the week of the 20th so we're looking forward to that and we have a talk on turpentine and we're working on some things related to the new sponge exhibit at the Carabelle History Museum because we are uh, we have if you haven't come by to see it it's a fabulous exhibit on sponge diving in Carabelle, which is a fascinating topic in general, and particularly it was interesting to discover that we had quite a sponge trade in Carabelle. We found postcards from 1913 that showed the, the sponge dealers at the dock selling sponges with big, huge piles, and uh, which was all part of what was going on in Apalachicola, but we happen to be closer to the sponge beds out in Dog Island, so the, the guys came over here and took boats out here. So those are gonna be the rest of our topics this year, and we're looking forward to uh, several other major events. I, I do wanna point out that thanks to our speaker, Josh Weaver, we have a wonderful deal this week on memberships to the Carabella Historical Society. If you join today for a $15 membership or a $20 membership, you get a free uh, copy of Josh's book on uh, touring the stadium with the Orioles mascot. I know I didn't get that quite right, but it's a darling book for kids of all ages that like baseball, but particularly something very appropriate for grandchildren and children this time of year. And I think, uh, and he'll be glad to autograph it. So, so we're, um, you know, that just reminded me, I didn't turn off my phone, so that probably better do that as well. Um, so we have our membership deal, we have our, um, okay. I would like to um, particularly thank our volunteers, Some, many of them are not here today because they were here yesterday setting up the room and we are uh, going to ask you today when we're done if you'll help us put the chairs back down on the lower level. So that will be that'll that'll be after we get done. And Mel, what did I forget? She always tells me what I forgot. Did I forget anything, Mel? You did fine, and I'm not sure if you have to move the chairs if there's no other program. Oh, that's true. Okay. Well, we'll just we'll be glad to leave it. Okay. Um, I'm really excited about today's program because I personally am a big fan of Buck O'Neill's. And I know that the, what we have here today are two, two men who are very enthusiastic about baseball and enthusiastic about the, the career of Buck O'Neill and his contemporaries. And we 
We're real proud of Buck Emile, who was born in Caribel in 1911. And we are, uh, his grandmother lived here, his mother lived here. And we think that they were here for generations. We are working on his genealogy, and we've discovered um, quite a lot of interesting things about that. And the sad thing is, as a black child in that era, the schools for black kids only went to the sixth grade. So when he got through the sixth grade here, his parents moved to Sarasota. And um, his dad worked in the celery fields and so that he could go to high school the rest of the way. But the only school, there, it's really an interesting condition in the state of Florida at that time. Black, the only black children that could go to high school beyond the eighth grade were children that happened to live in, in Miami, Orlando, Jacksonville, and Tampa. There was one school in each of those towns that went to the 12th grade and then for black children. And as you would remember, the schools were segregated then. So there was, it was very um, difficult for Buck O'Neill to get an education. And he was very determined, and his family was very determined for him to get an education. So when he maxed out at school in uh, Sarasota, he transferred up to Jacksonville, where they had a feeder high school that went into the college fair. I'll skip about the first five slides here now. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I just, I think the way that the, the state of Florida was organized around that, it's really uh, an interesting comment. Of course, the schools in Carabell were um, segregated as well at that time. So it was, um, it was, it was those times, and I'm glad we're not in those times anymore. And we have a lot more about that sort of thing at the museum. And I want to tell you that um, we want you to come by the museum and see our exhibit that we have there. But we want you today, to, when we get done, to come up and look at this fabulous exhibit that's up here right now. And so I better stop talking about stuff and introduce the guys because they both like to talk and we could be here a long time. So let's see. I think really Wes Singletary is, um, I have all of his like credits and creds and he went to college and he's got all kinds of credentials. At the moment, at the moment he is, um, Partially teaching school at Child's High School. No, I'm full time at Child's. Oh, you're partially, full, partially, partially at PCC. PCC. Okay. I've been partial at TCC forever. Like 27 years or yeah, something, so according to your bio. And um, so he's he's a history he's a history nut as well as a baseball nut. And um, I think that I'm learning baseball nuts are some of the most interesting people. And we're really delighted that we were able to have him here today. I fussed at him because he didn't bring his book. He has a number of books and that we could at least show you. But if you go on Amazon and look up his name, you'll find books because he has lots of books and books about baseball. And so I'm going to let him tell you that and I'm going to let him try to go back and cover what I missed on the book on your uh, pedigree here. Um, so here is Wes Singletary. Hey, thank you. Do I need this microphone? Yes. My voice carries. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I forgot you were going to do that. Yeah. Well, my name is Wes Singletary, like she said. I appreciate y'all having me down. I am originally from Tampa, and I'm actually from West Tampa. That's, West Tampa is a strange place. No, nobody there is anything other than half this, half that. You know, like half Italian, half Cuban, half, half Cuban, half cracker like I am. You know? <laughs> and, but the one thing we all have in common is baseball. People look at the Tropicana Field and they're like, well, that's what Tampa, they can't support a baseball team. First of all, Tropicana Field is in St. Petersburg, it's not in Tampa. And people in Tampa have to get on that bridge to get to Tropicana Field, and those bridges are brutal. I mean, you get stuck in traffic too easy, but I'm a big Rays fan. I watch them on TV every night. My daughter graduated college, and uh, 
got her own place. First thing I did was slap a 70 inch TV in her bedroom, and I haven't seen my family during baseball season. <laughs> Me and my dog, we sit in there and watch the game. So I, um, I was fortunate. I was able to go to Florida State. I, well, I went to the Air Force first, and then I was able to go to Florida State. And uh, when I did, I just, history's the one thing I liked. You know, I mean, you, I'm that kind of guy, I can't study something I don't care for. I have to really be into it. And I don't know why. You could make me a lawyer or a doctor, but I can teach some history. Uh, so I was able to get my PhD at Florida State, studying with uh, Dr. Jim Jones. And he's probably the only professor there that would allow me to write a dissertation on baseball. And uh, my dissertation was a biography of Al Lopez, uh, the great Hall of Fame manager from Tampa. But more importantly to this subject, when I was in grad school, I wrote a term paper on John Henry Lloyd. Like Buck, John Henry Lloyd is a Florida guy, okay? Uh, Lloyd's maybe a generation older than Buck, but they were good friends. And uh, Pop Lloyd came out of Palatka, was raised in Jacksonville, and worked his way up into the Negro Leagues pretty much along the same path that Buck did. And I wrote a term paper on, on Lloyd, and then uh, later on, I was able to do a book that centered around him, but it was generally speaking on the Negro Leagues from about the early 1900s up until the early 1930s. And that really brought me into the orbit of Buck O'Neill. I mean, I always heard of Buck O'Neill, but you know, there, there's a couple of Bucks in the Negro Leagues. You got Buck Leonard, okay? And I said Buck Leonard first. He's a Hall of Famer. Uh, Buck O'Neill was a good ball player, and he was a very good manager. And he absolutely today belongs in the Hall of Fame but much more so for his life and his accomplishments uh, as a ambassador for, for the Negro Leagues, as well as you know everything he's done for Major League Baseball. We'll talk about it, but Buck was the first African-American coach in the baseball's Major Leagues coming over the Chicago Cubs. Um, I wanted to meet Buck. So this is probably around 1993, and Buck was touring with Ken Burns uh, for the baseball documentary. And they were actually at a conference commemorating the 100th anniversary of Babe Ruth being born. And the conference was at Hempstead on Long Island at Hofstra University. So I go up there, and Buck is giving his talk. And Buck O'Neill's the kind of guy, and most of you, you have an interest in him, or you wouldn't be here. But he's the kind of person that he makes you better by being in his presence. And Buck was that way, but more so than that, you wanted to be a better person because of who he was. You figured to yourself that if he could go through everything he did and still have this kind of attitude and this very positive outlook on life, that he, he must be something special. And he was. And so I sat there listening to him, just wrapped it with attention. And when he was finished, me and another guy on the other side of the room made a beeline for him to talk to him. Well, it turns out the other guy was Gerald Lindsley from Tallahassee Democrat. I'd never met Perk up until that point. Perk passed away a few years ago. He was a great guy with a Democrat, and I, but I'd never met him until that point. And he and I sat there with Buck, and I'll give Buck credit. His handlers had to get him out of there because we weren't going to let him go. But I was, that's the one time I was able to talk to him, and I was asking questions about the league and about John Henry Lloyd in particular. And the last connection I want to make between those two is one of Buck's big statements. It was the title of his autobiography. Uh, based on the question, do you think you were born too soon? And he said, no, I was born right on time. Right on time. I got to hear Charlie Parker. I stayed in the best hotels. I ate in the best restaurants. And he'd go on and on. I've got a photo of Buck sitting next to John Henry Lloyd in Atlantic City the day they dedicated the baseball stadium in Atlantic City to John Henry Lloyd. John Henry Lloyd gave a speech that day. And it was based on, again, were you born too early? And John Henry Lloyd said, no, I was born at the right time, okay? And so I, I guess the point I'm making is a lot of these guys had that same positive attitude. You know, Buck and John Henry Lloyd, they weren't just good friends, but they were the same kind of guys. And they were, they were deep into their, their, their religion and they loved their wives and they, they just were the kind of men you wanted to aspire to be. You know, they loved Buck O'Neill in Kansas City. I don't know if any of you have ever been out there. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute of the museum. But they loved him there. Uh, he was born here. You know, and he lived here until he was nine years old and he moved down to Sarasota and then worked his way up. And we'll talk about that briefly, but they, they adore him in Kansas City. Well, it's the same thing in Atlantic City with Pop Lloyd. You know, Pop Lloyd's from Jacksonville, from Palatka, where he was born. But they just adore that guy. And there's just something about men like this that make you want to get up on a Saturday morning and go talk about him. 
Okay, uh, it was not a far drive. I live in Tallahassee. I hitchhiked down here if I had to. I love coming down. Or I'd have called the sheriff. My buddies with the sheriff in Appalachian Coal, I would have called him and said, come get me. You know, he'd have brought me in in chains. And that would have been funny for all y'all. You know, here, I'll let him talk for a minute. But <laughs> some of y'all know A.J. Smith. He and I go way back. But uh, let's go ahead. Let's start talking a little bit more about Buck. I made this presentation. I usually don't do this. Usually I just get up and talk. But this thing kind of keeps me on track. So which, uh, which one changes it? This the arrows? Yeah. You can see I never use these things. Okay, this is a quote. Any of the quotes that I have up here, if you see them in italics, they're direct, direct quotes from Buck. Uh, let me get some orders here. Normally, that's not an issue, but I don't know, I woke up with a scratchy throat. Where does bitterness take you? To a broken heart? To an early grave? When I die, I want to die from natural causes, not from hate eating me up from the inside. Buck O'Neill, okay, that, that, that's as good a quote as he can give about who the, who the man really was. He had every reason in the world to be angry. Every reason in the world to be angry. But all he saw, at least overtly, uh, what were the things in life that he was blessed with, the things in life that he could convey to others. And I think that makes the man, and that's as good a statement about anybody as you'd ever want to want to have him talk about. Uh, as, as you know, here's a picture of young Buck, his old picture of Caravelle there. He's born here in Caravelle, November 13th, which is at his birthday, 1911. And by 1920, like she said, he couldn't go to school past sixth grade here. So they moved on down to Sarasota, uh, worked in the celery fields. Now, his father worked in the fields, and Buck did too, but Buck wasn't out chopping celery. Buck was the guy that would carry the crates uh, to get them for the packing. He'd carry the crates out. It was like a box boy is what they call them. And he'd carry the boxes out for the packing. And there's a, a story that he tells one time. It must have been, you know, 150 degrees down there. And he just says out loud, like, this, this son, it's got to be a better damn thing to do than this. And his father heard him cuss. And, you know, so his father gets with him and says, look, it, there's something, there is something better. But you're going to have to get out of here. Okay? You're going to have to go someplace else to get it. Okay? The Jim Crow South, Jim Crow Florida, is not going to be that place. Um, the one thing about being around Sarasota, he was close to baseball, and his father, knowing how much he enjoyed it, and by the way, his father was a son of slaves. Buck's grandparents were all slaves, and Buck knew his grandparents. And like Pop Lloyd, his grandparents were slaves, and Pop Lloyd's grandmother raised him. So these guys were eyewitnesses to history just by growing up around their family. Uh, but but his, his father and, uh, and his uh, father were there in Sarasota would take him out to see the ball games in places like Tampa and elsewhere. And he got to meet by hanging around, being one of the kids. He got to meet the Bambino up there, the Big Bam, George, Herman, Ruth. On the left here, he got to meet Lefty Grove, Robert Moses Grove, Walter Johnson. Uh, they asked him, when uh, Walter Johnson, the, considered by many the greatest pitcher of all time, they asked him, who throws harder than you, anybody? And Walter Johnson said Lefty Grove. And Charlie Gerringer, the Hall of Fame uh, second baseman with the Detroit Tigers agreed with him. Uh, Lefty Grove could throw smoke. And then on the bottom right there, you get Dizzy Dean. And, uh, you know, Buck O'Neill got to meet these guys. And he, he worshipped them. He idolized them. You know, he talked years later about how the crack of Babe Ruth's bat was like a small stick of dynamite going off. And then later on, he compared it to Josh Gibson. Then he said he heard it again when Bo Jackson played baseball. So I sound like a small stick of dynamite. I can't explain it, but I know it when I hear it. Buck under, excuse me, Buck's uncle. Buck had an uncle that didn't live in Sarasota. He worked with the railroad. He would travel down to Sarasota during the winter and take Buck and his father over to Palm Beach. He said, you want to see some real baseball? Let's go to Palm Beach. Well, what was going on in Palm Beach? We got the big hotels. You got the Royal Poinciana. You got the Breakers. And what they would do is they would hire the greatest Negro League ball players in the world, bring them to Palm Beach, give them jobs as, as porters, or I keep, sorry about this mic here. They give them jobs as porters. Uh, they, they work as, you can't really see the picture here, but it's like a bicycle cab, you know? Uh, and they would haul people's luggage around or haul them around. Uh, and then they would play for the baseball teams, and they had great games. And, and like I said, Buck's uncle worked with the railroad. He'd come down, he'd get him, he'd get his father and take him over to Palm Beach. And that's where Buck got to see some of the greatest baseball players ever on the Negro League side. Guys like Ruth Foster and Pete Hill Grant Johnson. Grant Johnson was an early mentor to John Henry Lloyd. 
Okay, and Buck, to an extent, was a, I mean, excuse me, John Henry Lloyd, to an extent, was a mentor to, to Buck O'Neill. You see how it just conveys itself. And they, like I said, played for the hotel teams while working as porters at the Royal Poinciana, the Breakers, and elsewhere. And Buck commented that this is my kind of ball. There's never a dull moment in this type of baseball. I mean, he just loved what he saw. These pictures up here, you see John Henry Lloyd here with the big A on his shirt. That's for Amadadas, the, the Alcrans, the Scorpions out of the uh, Cuban League. They refer to John Henry Lloyd down there as Sam Lloyd. Because a lot of these African-American ball players, they'd arrive in Cuba, and initially they'd get a lot of the same kind of racist stuff that they would get here in the United States. I mean, Sam was a, a derivative of Sambo, uh, which, you know, the Sambo thing always gets me. As a historian, I understand the slaves would, would put on what the historians would call a Sambo mask, okay, to, to resist. I mean, I can get out of work by acting stupid, by acting shiftless, by acting lazy. I'm resisting, but in doing that, I'm creating a stereotype where all people think blacks are lazy, shiftless, sambos. And so that name was kind of tossed at, at John Henry Lloyd, but he was a good sport about it. And gradually his play garnered such respect down there, nobody uh, in, you know, anywhere near him would, would have anything but good things to say. And of course, up there, the right-hander, Rube Foster, belongs in the Hall of Fame as a player. He's in the Hall of Fame now as a manager, as an entrepreneur. Uh, the creator of the Chicago American Giants, one of the great Negro League teams of all time. But Ruth Foster belongs in the Hall of Fame as a player. John Henry Lloyd is already there. Uh, Sarasota High School, picture of it here. It was segregated, uh, and so Buck wasn't allowed to attend. I mean, like, like uh, we were talking earlier, there were four high schools in the state of Florida that allowed black students to enroll, and uh, Sarasota High was not one of them. You know, years later, <coughs> After Buck was in the Ken Burns documentary, uh, the, the leaders of the school district down in Sarasota brought Buck to town. And they brought him back to Sarasota and they awarded him a diploma. And then he had tears in his eyes and he was speaking to the students. He was like, I'm just so choked up about this. Because my mother, my father, my grandmother wanted nothing more than for me to graduate high school. Now ultimately he did at a different school. He goes, and I know they're here with me, taking this diploma from Sarasota High School. But at that time, Jim Crow South, it wasn't allowed. So again, you can't go to Sarasota High School. It's not for black kids. That's a quote, that's what his grandmother told him. Okay, and he was upset about it, but they sent him off. They sent him to Jacksonville, where Ed Wetters was the, for Ed Wetters uh, College. Now, matter of fact, one of my ball players, I do a lot of coaching baseball around Tallahassee, and one of my players plays football for Ed Wetters right now. But Ed Wetters was the first independent higher learning institution in Florida, open to African Americans, and Buck played both baseball and football there. He obtained his high school diploma as well as two years of college. So ultimately, it was a good thing for him to be able to matriculate. Another great Florida baseball player who attended Edwards College out of Jacksonville, probably my next research subject on the Negro Leagues, a guy named Richard uh, Dick Lundy. Anybody's conversation, Dick Lundy's among the top three shortstops in the history of black baseball. And he attended Edwards as well. Um, after leaving Ed Wetters, Buck goes on and plays semi-pro baseball in Tampa with the Tampa Black Smokers. I mean, you see that a lot in the Negro League. All right, you see a lot of, uh, there he is. You see a lot of uh, ball clubs would be like the Birmingham Barons or the organized ball of the Birmingham Black Barons is the Negro League team. Tampa had the same thing, but the Black Smokers was kind of like the Pepsi of Giants down there. They were a uh, semi-pro team, but he got some experience playing for them. By the next year, he played for the Miami Giants, then moved on to a team called the New York Tigers, 1935. The fun thing for me about this team is they weren't from New York. The team was based like in Miami. They called themselves the New York Tigers because they used to go around and tell people they were from New York. And it, it seemed to help them schedule games with other town teams and so forth. Teams out of town, but the New York Tigers, he was able to play in the Denver Post Tournament and he was able to play in the Wichita, Kansas tournament. These were the two largest uh, tournaments allowing black ball players in the country at that time. And they were integrated teams that would play there. And uh, one of the guys that would play there on an integrated team from Bismarck, North Dakota of all places, was Satchel Page. And this is where Buck meets Satchel Page and they become lifelong teammates as well as friends. And I think anybody uh, who's studied anything about baseball knows anything about baseball understands there's really no one better than Satchel Page. I mean, he pitched in the 1948 World Series. He was probably 55 years old. 
You know, he got hung around and played forever. Uh, by 1936, Buck was playing with the Acme Giants. And uh, the fun thing about that team for me is that they tried to get into the Mexican League, and they went down there and there was a tournament that they had to win. If they won that tournament, they'd be allowed into the Mexican League. But they lost, they got beat. When they got beat, they were sent home. And Buck said, it's a tough league when they deport you if you lose. So I, was, I, was pretty, I thought it was pretty good. Excuse me if you don't mind. I'm as dry today as I've ever been. If you know me, like some of these people in here do, talking in an issue, but look, today I'm there. One of the things that Buck in later years would seem almost apologetic about, although he really didn't have a reason to be, because he's earning, he was earning money, was he played baseball in 1937 as well. Well, in 1937, he played with the Memphis Red Sox, but then he went and played with Abe Saperstein, Zulu Cannibal Giants. Anybody in here can tell me who Abe Saperstein was? What team he's famous for organizing and promoting? The Harlem Globetrotters. The Harlem Globetrotters, absolutely. Okay. Well, the Zulu Giants were the same kind of thing. It was almost a minstrel show. All right. They would dress up like Africans, and they would. You know, when I say Africans, I mean like stereotypical African natives with with you know straw dresses and masks and you know bones and all kinds of stuff. And they would go out there and play barefooted. And, but, but the white folks came out in droves to watch them play. Okay, they were appealing to white crowds. And, you know, sometimes you suck up and you do what you got to do make, to make money. I mean, Buck said, we acted like a bunch of fools to draw white folks to the park. He goes, well, we'd do anything to play ball. We'd become conditioned to racism. And I think that last statement is as powerful as, as one can make. You know, racism is always there. It divides us then it divides us today. And a lot of us don't even aware that we're playing into it, but it's there because we've become a condition to it. And because of that, Buck played for this team. Uh, you know, look at these, these banners. The cannibals are coming. The greatest and strongest Negro baseball team in America will meet the Georgetown Athletics, or, you know, Athletics versus the Zulu Cannibal Giants. Um, again, he played for one season. It's not something I think he was the most proud of because it was one thing you can't really talk your way about. What do you do with playing with those idiots? That kind of thing. But like you said, we do anything to play ball. And that was in 1937, right on the cusp of him joining the Negro National League because the next year, he was with the Kansas City Monarchs. He tried out with Kansas City. He was playing uh, on a semi-pro team in Shreveport. Kansas City came to town, and uh, they saw him play, and he went out and tried out with them, and he was able to make the team. J.L. Wilkinson was the primary owner of the Monarchs. He owned the team for 20 years. Uh, he had a, a, a partner named Tom Baird, uh, and it was both of them that signed Buck to play in 1938. I've been to Kansas City, and I've, I've gone over to Lawrence, to the University of Kansas, and I've looked in the Tom Baird files uh, for information on actually a couple of different uh, Kansas City Monarchs. One guy named Curtis Harris that I recently wrote a biography on for, uh, for another organization. but. But Tom Baird, as well as J.L. Wilkinson, have roots to the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Tom Baird especially. And it's one of those things that you can never tell by the way they acted with their ball players, and the way they treated their ball players, and the way they, they approached how to, to work hard to put these guys in a position to win. But from what I gather, and I got this from Bob Kendrick, and if, if you ever have a moment, go on the internet and listen to Bob Kendrick talk about anything. He's one of the best speakers in the country. He's the executive director of the Negro Baseball Museum, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. You buck as well as anybody. And, and he told me, he said, you know, in Kansas City at that time, if you were white, you weren't a member of the Klan, you didn't get any business. You didn't do any business. So, you know, it's a, it, I've heard other people, you know, describing those same kind of uh, situations, a man of their times and all that. But nonetheless, it was a fact. But uh, Buck remains with this organization as a player and or manager for the next 17 years, right up until really the league falls apart in 1955. Uh, and it, it was a glorious time to be in Kansas City if you want to talk to Buck. I mean, the team, yeah, the team lived in a block-only hotel. But guess what? Some of the black hotels were the best hotels in town. They had the best cooks. They had the best music. You know, I mean, that, that, that's what, what he says you can't. Look, think, you know, feel bad for me for living there. They stayed at the hotel near Kansas City's famous 18th and Vine District. Now, that district's long dead. You go there now and you can see that they've tried to spend some money to jazz it up a little bit, pun intended. But uh, other than the Jazz Museum and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, there's just not a lot there right now. 
But I was there uh, last year. He said, picture of their 18th and 5. I took that. But Buck says, you know, these are some of the people he met, he knew, he was friends with from performing in that area. You know, Duke Ellington and Charlie Parker and Cab Calloway. You got Joe Lewis here and Judy Holliday and down there, Bill, Bo Jangles, Robinson. Uh, he tells one story how he was out one night with Duke Ellington, and they were on the corner of, uh, actually it wasn't Duke, he was with Langston Hughes, and they were on the corner of 18th and Vine, and they, they saw this little chubby cat playing a saxophone, and he was all over the place, but, but he goes, if you listen to it, he goes, it, it, it finally started to make sense, and it was brilliant. He was talking about Charlie Parker, uh, right there on the street corner in Kansas City playing. Uh, Buck says, New Orleans may have been the birthplace of jazz, but Kansas City is where it grew up. The 18th and fine, you couldn't toss a baseball without hitting a musician. It was just an exciting time to be there, and that's, he always conveyed that, how exciting it was. Um, from 1939 to 1942, from a baseball standpoint, this is one of the great baseball teams in history. From 39 to 42, the Kansas City Monarchs won every, every league championship, including in 1942, and they bested the mighty Homestead Braves four games to zero. Now, who were some of the players on the Homestead Braves? Well, let's see. They had Josh Gibson. They had Ray Brown, Buck Leonard, Judd Wilson, all four in the Hall of Fame. And that 42 Kansas City Monarch team had three Hall of Famers. They had Satchel Page, they had Sonny Brown, and they had Hilton Smith. But you know what? Kansas City also had Newt Allen. Newt Allen belongs in the Hall of Fame, and they have Buck O'Neill, and Buck O'Neill belongs in the Hall of Fame. So all in told, that 42, uh, you understand why that 42 team was as good as it was. You know, Willard Brown's an interesting story. He's a great player. One of those guys, even Josh Gibson would say, I don't hit him where you hit him. Okay? But they call him Sonny because if it was a sunny day, let me back up. You're playing baseball in the Negro Leagues. During the week, you barnstorm, you play the local white teams, you know, and you're doing it from scratch just to get by. But it was on the weekends, especially on Sundays after church when everybody came out and macked out. They got their suits on and the ladies got their beautiful dresses and they're nice hats and there's there's barbecue and there's fish fry and it's a scene. And they said on days like that, Sonny Brown showed up and he was Willard Brown. Okay, but during the rest of the week, he kind of lazy, just go through the motions. Wouldn't worry about running out, the extra base, those kind of things. Because it just didn't mean anything to him. He didn't like playing in those kind of, those conditions. The idea was that if he'd ever been in the big leagues, it would have always been sunny. All right, well, Willard Brown had a chance to sign with the Yankees. The Yankees were looking for a Negro League player. He would have been their first player. They talked to Buck, because by then Buck was, was a manager at the Monarchs. And they talked to Buck about bringing Willard Brown over. Willard Brown, they thought he was 28. He was probably about 34 by then. And Buck told him, in all honesty, you want to look at Elston Howard. Young, big, strong, got the bat. And the Yankees took Elson Howard as their first African-American player. Willard Brown became the first African-American baseball player for the St. Louis Browns. Well, any of y'all know anything about the St. Louis Browns? The only pennant I think they might ever won was during World War II. When they had Pete Gray, that one-arm baseball player, some other guys. But uh, the St. Louis Browns were garbage. They were the worst team in baseball. It's hard to be sunny when you play for the St. Louis Browns. And so Willard Brown's major league career was, was very insignificant. But as an Negro Leaguer, he's a Hall of Famer, and these were exceptional teams here that Buck played for and against. Here's a picture of Buck over there, stretching for one. On Easter, this, this is what Buck always called his, his best day, okay? Any of y'all know what hitting for the cycle is? Any baseball fans in here, what's hitting for the cycle? What's hitting for the cycle? All the way around a single, double, triple, home run. Right, you get a single, and in the same game, a single, a double, a triple, and a home run. The Bucks in Memphis, they're playing the Memphis Red Sox on Easter Sunday, 1943. You can imagine the people that were out in front of that great crowd, and he hits them a double. And then he hits them a triple, which is always the hardest leg of the, of the, of the, uh, of the cycle. And then he hits, he hits, no, let me back up. He hits a single, he hits a homer. Then he hits a double, and his last at bat, he crushes one of the deepest part of the park. And he run into first base, he's like, man, please, please hit that fence. And sure enough, the ball hit that fence, and he's breaking around second, headed for third. Third base coach is sending him in, and Buck said, "Nope." <laughs> he pulls up, and he got his triple, and he got his cycle. Okay, but that's not why it was his best day. He goes back to the hotel, and he's upstairs, and Dizzy Dizzy, a former Negro leaguer who's like the traveling secretary with the with the Monarchs, says, "Buck, you got to come down. We got to do some politics." And Buck says, what do you mean? He goes, well, I got members of the school board down here. We want you to meet them. 
So Buck comes downstairs, and he, Buck, me and Buck walked straight up to the first person he saw, a young lady, and he extended his hand and said, I'm Buck O'Neill. You know, and she said, nice to meet you. I'm Ora Lee Owens. Ora Lee Owens became the love of Buck's life. They were married a couple years later after his service in World War II, and uh, they were married for 51 years. Uh, she actually passed away of cancer the day after the museum, the Negro Links Museum in Kansas City was open, which was, well, as, as you'll see, that was Buck's baby. Uh, drafted in the Navy in 1943, Buck served out World War II, assigned to a stevedore battalion in the Mariana Islands. Stevedores are like, you know, they load the ships and so forth. Uh, he takes charge of a, of a group. He's, he's promoted to, uh, excuse me, I'm getting thirsty over here again. He's promoted to Boston First Class. He has a crew of about a dozen men working under him. And one day, you know, the only way he could keep up with the monarchs was people would send him clippings from the Negro League, uh, excuse me, from the Negro newspapers, the black press, okay? Whether it was the Chicago Defender, the Amsterdam uh, News, uh, what have you. They would send him clippings from the black press and he could keep up with the monarchs. And he knew from keeping up with the monarchs, they had a young guy who just got out of the service named Jackie Robinson. And Jackie was tearing it up. Jackie was having a great season with the Monarchs in 1945. Well, one day at the end of the season, Buck is called in by his commanding officer and he tells him, hey, Jackie Robinson just signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, you think about this. Here Buck is stuck on the other side of the world, okay? And he had been in the Marianas. I, I think it was a Subic Bay in the Philippines by this point. Probably had every reason in the world to resent that it wasn't him. Oh, my God. But he didn't. He was just so thrilled. I mean, he couldn't wait. He grabbed the loudspeaker that talked to the whole compound and yelled out there that Jackie Robinson uh, had signed with Brooklyn. And we started hollering and shouting and firing our guns in the air. He said, uh, I mean, he talked about how he didn't think there was that much noise on, on, on V-Day than, uh, <laughs> you know, than, than when Jackie Robinson signed. He said, this was the first real step toward equality since Reconstruction. Okay. Um, he really believed that with Jackie Robinson. I mean, I've heard other people say it, that the civil rights movement began with Jackie Robinson signing. Now, of course, Jackie Robinson was just a, a step in the road, the long road to freedom. But, uh, you know, nonetheless, Buck was very excited about it. Had nothing but, you know, respect for Jackie Robinson uh, throughout Jackie's life. And they were so excited when they found out. And here's uh, this painting. Uh, oh, what's his name? You probably know his name, Josh. It's Kinnear or something like that. Greg, uh, he does a lot of great paintings, but um, actually, you know what? He didn't do this painting. What's wrong with me? Um, it'll come to me. I, I had COVID about a year and a half ago, and people keep asking me, you feeling all right? My lungs are about 85%, but that's not the issue. The issue to me is that short-term memory. Loss. I talk about Buck. I can't tell you where I left my keys. Okay, and you know, this guy, Kadir Nelson. Kadir Nelson is the premier African-American artist on Negro Leagues as well as any other number of stuff. Uh, if you look at my book on John Henry Lloyd, Kadir Nelson did a painting of John Henry Lloyd, and I was fortunate enough for him to allow us to use it for the cover of the book. But this is a painting by Kadir Nelson of Jackie playing for the uh, playing for the uh, Kansas City uh, uh, Monarchs. And Jackie, see, he was nothing but an athlete. You know, Jackie Robinson was a four-sport athlete at, at UCLA. He was a three-sport All-American. Baseball wasn't his best game. It's where he could make some money. Yeah, it's where he could make a earn a living. You know. But uh, Buck was thrilled for Jackie Robinson. Uh, by 19, uh, what was the date I've got up here? 1948, Buck becomes the player manager of Kansas City Monarchs. He's, and, and he's talking to Dizzy Dismukes. He's like, man, I what do I do to manage? And Dismukes tells him, well, some guys need pats on the back. Some guys need, need kicking the butts. Some guys need to be left alone. And Buck said, yeah, some guys need all three. <laughs> and uh, then Buck goes forward, and you know, the Monarchs win the pennant his first season. But then they lose in the playoffs to Birmingham Black Barons, who go on to uh, lose, uh, excuse me, they go on to beat the Home State Grays in the World Series that year. But that was the last Negro League World Series to be played because the league is folding up after that season. The Monarchs are going to continue on barnstorming for a time, largely because Buck is out like a bird dog siding ball players. You know, we're at the time here, by 1949, 1950, where the Major League is grabbing up all the good black players now. So it's all Buck could do to keep good players on the field. So as soon as the, as soon as the big leagues would, would take one of his players, he'd go out and find another one. He becomes an exceptional scout. So much so, the Chicago Cubs will hire him to be a scout. And while scouting for the Cubs or the Kansas City Monarchs, 
He's able to find some of the great players in Major League history. I mean, you look up here at these pictures. These are all players that Buck O'Neill discovered and signed. Okay, Ernie Banks, Mr. Cup, right here. Let's play two. Buck O'Neill says when he met Ernie Banks, when Banks came to play for the Kansas City Monarchs, he was 19 years old. Buck found him and brought him in. 19 years old, said he was painfully shy. Would sit in the back of the bus, you know, and not even interact with the other players. And Buck was like, man, you've got to love this game. You want to be good at this game? You've got to love this game. And if you know anything about Ernie Banks, man, he would run to the top of the steps before every game. It's a beautiful day for baseball. Let's play two. Well, that didn't come natural. That was heavily influenced by Buck. And he would tell you that. Okay, Ernie Banks is going to leave shortly after there and go, to, go into the Army. And when he comes from the Army, he's a different man. And by then, Buck is scout for the Cubs. And the Cubs sign him, and he becomes Mr. Cub. But you look at all these other guys over here, and I love this picture of Buck. He's with the Cubs, and he's laughing. It's almost like he's got the last laugh here. You know, bringing all these players in the league. You got Ernie Banks, Hall of Famer. Lee Smith, Hall of Famer. Joe Carter hit that climatic home run uh, for Toronto to win the World Series uh, back in the 1990s. You got Billy Williams, Hall of Famer. Elston Howard, Hall of Famer. Lou Brock, one of the worst trades in the history of baseball when the Cubs gave Lou Brock away. Milk Pappas. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, to the St. Louis Cardinals, their arch rival. And then right here, the greatest Afro in the history of baseball, Oscar Gamble. Buck O'Neill found Oscar Gamble in the middle of nowhere. He was this little kid. Buck had gone to watch the semi-pro game. Yeah, they were terrible. But then this young kid came on the field. And he, you know, Buck just liked the way the kid carried himself. He wasn't a great hitter, but he ran hard. He did everything right. And so Buck convinces, uh, you know, convinces the Monarchs at the time, and then later on, Major League Baseball, to sign Oscar Gamble. Oscar Gamble has a great career. He wins World Series titles with the Yankees. And again, mostly known now for his Afro, but he's a good ball player. Of course, Elston Howard, excellent captain of the New York Yankees. Well, not the captain. They didn't have captains back then, but the catcher of the Yankees that took Yogi Berra's place. Uh, he was the rock on that team for a number of years. Uh, in 1962, Buck's going to be promoted to the Cubs from scouting to the coaching staff. Now, this is interesting. The Cubs, had, if any, let me, any Cubs fans in here? Okay, you might know better than I do. In the early 60s, the Cubs had kind of a ring around the rosy thing with their manager. They hired a number of coaches, and each of the guys would take turns managing the team. You know? And it was a strange situation. But when Buck was promoted to the coaching staff, it was assumed he was going to get his turn. And when he got his turn, he would become the first African-American manager in the history of the big leagues. Problem is, the Cubs didn't give him a turn. The Cubs didn't give him a turn. But you know what? It, it, it didn't matter. Uh, not to Buck. And after a couple of years, he just went back to doing what he did, which was scouting. That's what he loved to do. You see, you have to make the player believe in himself. And that's the one thing he learned more than anything as a coach. Because a lot of times... You look at these guys and you think they're great, but they really don't believe they belong. I mean, well, I think we're all that way to an extent. I mean, I'm sitting up here thinking, what am I doing talking to these people, wasting their time? A little punk kid from Tampa, Florida, up here in front of all these people. But, you know, you just have to believe that, that you're there for a reason, that you can do it. And that's the, the message you would impart to these ball players. You can do this. you got to believe in yourself. I mean, look at that face. If I had him coaching me, I'd run through a brick wall. You know? I never had coaches like that. I grew up in Tampa. We had those World War II veterans. I remember playing football. I had a coach who had a metal hook for a hand, okay, Macaluso. And he'd grab me by that face mask and shake it and tell me how sorry I was. I could still hear that metal rattling on my face mask. <laughs> you know, <I> could... <laughs> and I was talking to a guy in Tampa when we were down there, Josh, a couple weeks ago. And I said, do you remember that coach with a metal hook? And it was John Crumley, the winningest high school coach in the history of Hillsborough County. And Crumley said, that was Macaluso. <laughs> we all knew him. Um, like I said, Buck turns back to scouting in 64, and he does that through, uh, through 1988. And uh, after a brief retirement, by then his wife had retired from the Kansas City School Board, so he'd get back to Aura. He meets her before he goes in the Army, but he marries her when he comes home. And his parents didn't want her to marry him. I mean, they literally asked him, what does your, your father do for a living? And he said, well, my father's in entertainment. And they said, oh, well, they thought that was good. The only entertainment his father was in was running moonshine. And things of that nature. But, uh, you know, hey, we all got family that ran moonshine, right? I tell people all the time, I got moonshiners in North Georgia, moved to Florida, I kill a Baptist preacher. But that, that's a whole other story for another book. It is a true story. 
But uh, Buck, after you know, he, his wife retires from the school from the school district in Kansas City, so they, he stays retired for a couple of years. But you know, like like any other, like Al Pacino, they pulled him back. He just couldn't get away. He said, "When I started, but he you know, talk, just talking about scouting." He says, "When I started, I was making a hundred dollars a month. Hundred dollars a month for scouting. I get a dollar a day for meal money." He goes, "But in those days, you could get breakfast for fifteen cents, and you could eat dinner for thirty-five cents." He goes, "I only ate twice a day, so." So that worked out perfect, you know? That's wonder what his wife thought, <laughs> you know, but money, I, I doubt she made any more than he did being a school teacher. You look at these photos here, that's Buck with the Chicago uh, Cubs and his protege there, Ernie Banks. And down here is a picture of uh, Buck flanked by uh, Ernie Banks, and I think that's Billy Williams. Uh, 1994 is when a lot of people come, you know, Buck comes to the tents of a lot of people. I was in, Cooperstown in 1992, and there was a, a symposium, and I was working on my, my master's thesis or something. And uh, I went up there, and it was called, it had this real fancy name, the Cooperstown Symposium on Baseball and American Culture. And I went up there, and Ken Burns was there, and he was talking about this documentary he's working on. We all knew Ken Burns from his Civil War documentary. I mean, he was by this point famous because of that. And everybody wanted to know who's going to be the Shelby Foot in your baseball documentary. Because you know, if you've watched that Civil War, Shelby Foote was the central man. He, he was the one you couldn't wait for that video to come back to Shelby Foote, the old historian. And Ken Burns said, we got an old ball player named, named Buck O'Neill. And most people were aware of him because I think you guys are going to see something when I show this documentary because Buck just comes out of the camera. Okay, and it's absolutely what happens. In 1994, the Ken Burns documentary baseball turns Buck into an overnight sensation. He's a runaway star of the series. He, he tours the country with Ken Burns. I said, well, y'all saw him up in New York, uh, touting the film. And, and the whole time, Buck is sharing stories that he's been telling for 60 years by this point. And people can't get enough of it. There's a whole, if you remember that baseball documentary, each night was a different inning. I think it was the fourth inning or whatever. They called it Shadow Ball. And it was the Negro Leagues, and Buck just jumped out of the screen. Uh, but, of course, being Buck says, it's kind of nice to be discovered when you're 82 years old. <laughs> But he's been telling those same stories for 60 years. This is, you know, some of the some of the pictures you see from the from the uh, the video. Ken Burns on the bottom, Satchel Page on the cover of what was known as Shadow Ball, and then Baseball up here at Babe Ruth giving his final salute. Picture of Buck and Ken Burns down here on the right hand side, and another baseball from Ken Burns with with Jackie Robinson on the cover. Um, Buck got a lot of attention here, but he was already, by this time, working on something else. He was working on building the definitive Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. He's in Kansas City. He's working with Frank White. Any of y'all know who Frank White is? Any Royals fans? Yeah, he was a great second baseman uh, with the Royals back uh, in the 80s. I remember the Royals and the Yankees battling, it seemed like, every year. And Buck O'Neill and Frank White, uh, some historians like Larry Lester and others, began putting together a collection that ultimately could become this Negro League Museum. They wanted to put the definitive Negro League Museum on the map. At first, it was in a one-room office, okay, and Buck and Frank White would take turns paying the rent on it, okay, but, but gradually, they brought in others. They brought in Bob Kendrick, who I mentioned. Bob's the executive director now, but then he was a marketing director. And they got out and they started getting a lot of attention, and ultimately, they were able to raise the money to build the museum that's in place now, which, of course, is ever-expanding. I mean, I saw it last year, and I'm sure, well, actually the year before, we got the pandemic, but I'm sure it's grown since then. And uh, it opened up on November 1st, 1997, and what should have been one of the great days in Buck's life, but it was a somber time. The Buck's wife had been battling cancer for 15 years. She passed away the next day, but she got to see the museum open, and Buck said those were some of her final words. She goes, she was in my arms, and she told me, we made it, we got to see it open right before she died. So it's, 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 you know, again, here's a guy who's putting his entire life on this museum, uh, but then the love of his life passes away the next day. And, uh, you know, he, he had to, but, you know, be a buck. You always showed a good face. You always showed a happy face. Why well, feel sad for me? I had 51 years with this woman. You know, I've been married 40 years. I don't know how he feels. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. People here have been married longer than me. You know, I, one thing here, we got a guy over here in the audience, by the way. i got to draw some attention now. I'm coming down here today, and I think that the, the, the people happiest for me being here today are redfish. 
Because I'm here, Jody Campbell's here. He's not out there catching every redfish on this part of golf. So I, I thought, the first thing I thought of when I saw Jody, I going to be some happy fish today. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, Buck goes on, man. He just keeps, he keeps on doing it. By 2005, he travels to Washington, D.C., and he speaks before Congress. And what he, what he gets from Congress is a proclamation that his museum, the Negro Museum, is going to be designated as America's Negro League's Baseball Museum. Okay? Uh, all that's left is a few of us, and we're losing them every year. We're going to preserve stuff that's in attics and going to, going to rock, and guys' grandkids are going to throw out if we don't get in and preserve it and tell their story. And as I mentioned, nobody does it better than Bob Kendrick, who now is the executive director of that museum. Bob's from Columbus, Georgia. Uh, but man, he, can, he talks about that, about Buck and that museum. Uh, here's pictures of the museum. Now, these are pictures I took when I was out last. This is uh, the best part about the museum. There's got a baseball field in there. And at every position, they have a statue of one of the, probably what they believed to be the greatest player to ever play at that position. Now, they moved a couple of people around. I mean, Leon Day, better known as a pitcher, they had him in right field. Because you got to have Satchel Page on the mound. But, you know, a statue of Josh Gibson behind the plate, you know. There's Willie Wells of Diablo playing short and John Henry Lloyd playing second. You know, you got, you got Martin De Higo, Martin De Higo, El Immortal from Cuba, one of the two or three greatest players ever. He's in the Hall of Fame as a pitcher, a hitter, whatever you need. Uh, and then over here, well, I thought I have it up here. I've got him on a different uh, screen. Uh, it's, a, it's a backstop, and it's a wire backstop. And behind the backstop is a statue of like the manager looking out of the field, and that's the statue of Buck O'Neill. It's a wonderful museum to go to. And you see the collections and the jerseys and the lockers and so forth. Again, Oscar Charleston, that was Willie Mays before Willie Mays, out there man in center field. Um, you know, honors have certainly come his way. This is just a list of some of the honors. I mean, Kansas City especially, they named it Street Buck O'Neill Way. They renamed a bridge that crosses the Missouri River uh, after Buck O'Neill. They've actually had to tear that bridge down. They're re redoing it. Built a whole brand new bridge named after him. I already mentioned Sarasota High School, awarded him his high school diploma. The Missouri State Legislature commissioned a bust of his likeness that sits in the Capitol there at Jefferson City. I drove over and saw it. Uh, Buck was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by W. Bush. Uh, himself, uh, you know, a small baseball fan. Uh, there's a building right down the way from the museum there at 18th and Vine. That's the old YMCA building. Historically, very significant because that's where the Negro National League was formed. Well, that building now has come into the uh, possession of the, uh, the museum, and they've turned it into, or they're, they're still continuing to work on it. So there was a bad fire. There's some arsonists here a year or so ago. But it's now the Buck O'Neill Research and Education Center program of the Negro League's Baseball Museum. Of course, the one honor still eluded him is the, the, the Baseball Hall of Fame. In 2006, and, and I had a little bit of, of insight into this, because in 2006, there, there were a number of historians that were pulled in to vote on a collection. They essentially were told by the Hall of Fame, you got X amount of spots. Who do you want to see go in? And these guys met, and one of them, uh, Larry, uh, and of course, brain fart, um, it'll come to me, but I, I needed to talk to him about Pop Lloyd, so I drove down to Tampa to meet him. And he was on that committee, and he was upset that Buck O'Neill was not going in. And I remember we talked about it at the time. He said, we could put 30 guys in, but they're only giving us X amount of spots. And I was like, but how do you not put Buck in? I mean, this guy is the face of the Negro Leagues, and he was a good enough manager, and certainly a Hall of Fame scout. I mean, he's, he's the, total, the total package. Why don't you put him in? It's just these other guys are getting more votes. Well, they chose, they chose, you know, a number of ball players uh, to go in and Buck wasn't there. Buck missed it by one vote. One vote. And this was in 2006. Um, but, you know, Buck was upset about it. He was sad by it. But he didn't let it wear him out. You know what Buck did? He went to Cooperstown when they formally inducted these guys. Because so many of them had already passed away and didn't have family there. So Buck went there representing them. And he, he gives his speech, he says, you know, I've done a lot of things I really liked doing. But I'd rather be right here, right now, representing the people who helped build a bridge across the chasm of prejudice. I'm proud to have been a Negro Leagues ball player. So he put it all behind him and he went, he showed up at the Hall of Fame that day. And he represented these guys. And he did it in a, in a way that just makes you proud to think about it. 
And here's, here's pictures of some of these honors. Here's the bridge over there. And here's a part of the exhibit at the Negro Leagues Museum. Uh, this statue above here is actually in Cooperstown at the National Baseball Hall of Fame because they've named a humanitarian award after Buck O'Neill. And so you go in the Hall of Fame and there's a statue of Buck, but he's not there. And that's kind of, kind of, you know, cross purposes when you see it. Uh, the Rawlings has dedicated the Golden Glove after him. As I mentioned, there's a bridge, there's that bust that's in the Capitol. And this is Buck speaking of the Hall of Fame, the induction day in 2006. Uh, he passed away on October of that year, October 6, 2006, just shy of his 95th birthday. People ask me, how do you keep from being bitter? Man, bitterness will eat you up inside. Hatred will eat you up inside. Don't be bitter, don't hate. My grandfather was a slave, he wasn't bitter. I learned that from him, and you know what? I wouldn't trade my life for anybody's. I've had so many blessings in my life, I don't want people to be sad for me when I go. Be sad for the kids who die young. You should feel sad for a man who lived his dream. You know what I always say? I was right on time. And we says, we all say thank you, Buck O'Neill's. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wes. That is fabulous. Um, I, I learned so much that I didn't know. Really great. Um, I can't wait for Josh to show you some of the some of the memorabilia that Josh has brought with him, and some of the things that are actually in the case at the Carabell History Museum that we left in the case, so we make you go over there and look at it. Um, are the things you're talking about? They're things that represent uh, a lot of these occasions and so forth that happened. Um, I, I want to introduce Josh Weaver. Um, Josh has all kinds of normal life credits, but I have to tell you that this crazy guy walks into, the, it's one of those, it's like a joke, it's like this crazy baseball nut walks into the History Museum one day and says, so um, Buck O'Neill's from here. I said, yeah, he was a Negro League bait. yeah, yeah, you know. He gets cranked up and starts talking to me about Buck O'Neill and, and his career and his stuff and he starts showing me things. And it started, we, we made him go slow. We made him like, okay, we'll, we'll put out a couple of things. And then six months later, he's back with more stuff. So we put out, Wes, you need your bottle of water up here? No, I'll be right back. Okay. Um, and we just, and then all, then we find he's, how much stuff do I have to bring before I get a case? So we said, well, we'll let us get you a case and then we'll see. And now he's, I think he's looking for a wing of the, of the museum to uh, an entire Buck O'Neill room uh, at some point. But I, I will say we have a huge debt of gratitude to, to Josh because he is our favorite baseball nut. He drives up here from Crystal River where he has like a real job out in the world uh, doing good things and helping people. But the thing that he's famous for and love for in our eyes is being our, our, uh, our very own personal baseball. We actually have it labeled as our local, our favorite baseball nut up on the wall at the museum. And fortunately he took it uh, in with all the love that we intended it when we called him that. But if you've ever spent any time with Josh, you'll know it's a very good thing to name him. Um, so let me let you, let me not take up any more of your time, Josh. And I will give you back the microphone. So this is Josh Weaver. I think you're listed in the program as a baseball aficionado. So big, big word from Joe. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And, and I, because you, you've heard the story about me being the baseball nut, I have to tell that when Wes and I first met, we were, I was down, we were down at the Al Lopez Grand Opening. Um, so if you ever make it down to Tampa, you know it's it's uh, something to see down there. It's a, it's the, actually it's his home that they moved his, and and it's a great museum. When you're down there, go, you know, one thing, you know, that we, we've talked about is, well, Wes is going to talk about Buck's life, 
and then I'm going to talk about kind of what to, you know, to see. You know, so like I said, this is a tribute to Buck, and my part is going to be about travel, because like I said, that's where I met Wes. I come up to his, this is, i got to tell the story. Um, he was signing autographs, for, you know, from his book um, on Al, Al Lopez, and, and I come up and I said, I said, yeah, I said, you know, in a couple months we're going to do this, we're going to have an event for Buck O'Neill up in Carabao, and he's like, oh, okay, and, and we talked for a couple minutes, and then like a week later, Tamara said she contacted him, and he's like, yeah, he's like, I met that guy. <laughs> so yeah, we, yeah, so I guess I get around. But, you know, Wes did you know, such a great job, so I'm gonna kind of hit some of the highlights real fast, and kind of show you what, like, is it some of what we're gonna have at the museum. Um, the best thing is the travel, because you, you go to a place like Carabao, and I'm gonna read this real quick to you guys, and I apologize for reading, but you'll recognize this. Um, Carabao, Florida, home of the Negro Baseball League standout and recipient of Baseball's Lifetime Achievement Award, John Jordan Buck O'Neill Jr. You know, that's the sign when you come into town. I know sometimes you, it's, it's there and you guys sometimes just pass it because it's there every day for you guys. But you know me, I had to go stop, take pictures in front of it, and you know, because I'm the baseball nut. Um, but one of the things that we, that Wes covered is the love he had everywhere he goes. You know, the, the fact that you guys have the pride of him being from here in Carabao. You go to Sarasota, and you know, and I will say this, the Ted Williams Museum, there's there's a nice, it, if you haven't been, it, that's in Tropicana Field. So if you get a chance to go, it used to be in Citrus County, but after Ted Williams passed away, there wasn't the interest, so they moved it down to, which a lot of people, Obviously, in, in Tropicana Field, you get to go, and it's part of it's free. It's once you get get in the stadium, you get the to tour. But one of the things, and I and I apologize for reading again, but it's it's an important point because what I'm going to focus in on, and Les alluded to it quite a bit, is the fact that Buck O'Neill's not in the Hall of Fame. You know, we have tributes here in Carabao, as far as the sign coming in, and, and you know what we're working on at the museum. We have in Sarasota, they have. They renamed, and there's a photo, because like Wes said, and I, I'm gonna just hold this up to kind of, I know you guys can't see it, but there's images. They had Buck O'Neill week um, in 95, and that's when he graduated, so there's a photo, this is a press release photo with him and Ken Burns, and then Buck with his graduation down, and he gave the commencement speech from when he, when he got the degree, or his diploma from Sarasota. So obviously, Sarasota loves Buck. And if you go to the Ted Williams Museum, you can see. And I told this to Tamara, and she says, that's not right. Because in the Ted Williams Museum, Sarasota claims him as well. There's a, there's a poster that says, son of Sarasota. And I know that's a tough thing to say around here. And then when I told it to Tamara, she's like, what? Yeah, so like, that's not right. But everybody claims him. And like Wes said, you go to Kansas City. And Wes, you know, Wes is correct. There's just so many tributes to Buck in Kansas City. Uh, some of what I brought, is they still have Buck O'Neill giveaways. The, um, this was for his 100th birthday, you know, and this is something that, you know, we're gonna talk about how much, you know, later how much space I can take up in the museum, but this is a giveaway that they did for his 100th birthday. And he passed, as you guys know, he passed away by then. So they truly love Buck down in Kansas City. Um, like Wes said, there's a bridge named after him. There's, there's a Buck O'Neill bus. There's also a mon you know, a, a local train. Um, that's, it's actually for all of them. It says 22 on it for Buck O'Neill. That was his number. And it's also, there's a spot where there's, um, it says the Monarchs. Because the, the Kansas City Monarchs played such an important role. Like Wes said, basically, you think of the New York Yankees. They were the New York Yankees and the Negro Leagues. That's how good that team was. And Buck was there for a large portion of it. Um, so I'll put this back over. And there's a bobblehead up here when he gets afterwards, like Wes said. And, and I, I know you guys can't see it, but I'll hold it up. But, but on the, the back of it is the YMCA building, which Wes was speaking of, which is now the Buck O'Neill Learning Center. So again, Kansas City is all about Buck O'Neill. Um, and it's. And the museum is just fantastic. I'm gonna try to flip through. Like I said, I'm gonna kind of brush over some of what I was doing because Wes did such an awesome job. I, you know, I don't want to be redundant. I'm thinking wrong about that. 
So this is kind of some of the stuff we put in the museum. Um, yeah, the museum, I'm sorry, I apologize. It's the museum here, because I, I know I jump around to different museums. Um, and one of the things, some of the things I brought today is Wes was talking about the Cuban team, and Buck was on that team, one of the championship teams. So when you get a chance, this is the, the lineup card, if you will, from the team, the team photo from the 46, 47 team, which is also a huge year for Buck O'Neill because that's the two years he was in World War II, 44 and 45. Obviously, he came back in 46. Um, it's also his best, one of his best years as a player. He won the batting championship that year, which is, you know, pretty impressive. So he was. People forget he was actually a really pretty good player too, and that was in an era, like best mentioned, of player managers. Um, very, I think one of the last ones, and it's kind of ironic. Uh, Pete Rose was much more closer to our time frame, but like I said, all these things you'll give it a chance to look at later. And the sixty. Sorry about that. Fast forward. So again, one of the things we in Kansas City this represents the Buck O'Neill legacy seat, which they commemorated. And local local folks, whether it be a teacher or if it's a social worker or people that you know spent their, their careers helping others, they in each of the home games, they get to they get to sit in the Buck O'Neill seat. And there was a I read an article and they said, well what happens if Buck, you know, if someone doesn't show up for the Buck O'Neill seat and then who is their stand up? You know, there's our standby, and they're like, no one ever doesn't show up. I mean, it, it, even it's still in Kansas City, it's it's a pride thing for the folks in Kansas City. So, and we'll come back to this one because I, we, I do have some news about the Hall of Fame and kind of where we are right now. This is in Coffin Stadium in Kansas City. It's a bus and a buck. Um, like I said, Tim wanted me to focus in on some of the different places. So, like I said, Kansas City, everywhere you go is something about buck. I mean, when they have a, a bus, plus a train, it's like, yeah, what are you doing? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on the buck bus. Um, so this is, and then this is the Negro League Baseball Museum, and like Wes said, this was his baby. When they, oh, when they started this, what they did is they rotated. There were like a handful of guys, Buck was one of them, you know, the, the original founders of the museum. And it was in, a, it was in a, like an office space, just a small one-room office space. And now it's what what Wes, you know, you saw the photos of what he had. So it's they've really turned this into a, a major thing. And, and like Wes alluded to, this is basically the main part. I mean, you have to, it's kind of cool. If you love jazz, you go to the Jazz Museum, go back to this side. And if you love barbecue, you got to go to Arthur Bryant's. You know, it's just like when I'm here in Carabao, I'm a, I, I consider myself a cultural chameleon. You know, here I'm eating oysters, you know, because, yeah. I'm going to add to that about the barbecue. I was there and I told, Kendrick, I said, what about the closet of Brian? He goes, yeah, well, Mama went there. And I said, where do you go? And he said, Gates. <laughs> I went to Gates. There you go. <laughs> and that, that's what you do. You always got to ask the local. Like, when I got here, I said, Tamara, where, where do I go to eat? Where's some good oysters? So, but true. I mean, it, so I know of three presidents that have been on the Brian's. So, where do you go? Get some barbecue. But we'll come, like I said, this is similar to what my show. And this is also a Kauffman Stadium. There's a little presentation, a little video that they'll show. And there's, you can sit next to Buck. That again is another photo of, you know, down shot. And one of the things too, if you, when you travel, if you ever want to see different things about ballparks, this was during the, the ballpark tour. And whether you go to, uh, we were just up in Chicago recently. You know, go to, if you go to Wrigley, I mean, Wrigley Fenway, as you know, are the oldest two ballparks. But there's always new things in all the stadiums. And with this, it's the Buck O'Neill seat, in my opinion. And like I said, it's, it's something, it, people, the locals are incredibly proud to be part of that. And that's a, just a photo of one of the giveaways. Again, that's him signing. And this is, you know, at the cemetery. Oh, sorry, I'll get back. But really, at this point, what I'm gonna focus in on a lot is, is this. And like I said, I don't take up too much of everybody's time because Wes did such a fantastic job, but there's images that kind of go along with what he was talking about. It's relation. I actually talked about the baseball, but I emailed Ken Burns. I said, well, what nerd? 
they, they, they're very, they were very close towards the end of Buck's life. And I got a response. I told him what we were doing. And, he, and he, they wished us luck. Um, and that just shows a testament to Buck and his relationship with Ken Burns. But regarding the museum, one of the things that Wes was saying, there's a lot of the Negro League players that are, that are there, but there's a lot that's not. And again, I apologize for reading this, but with the tribute at the Ted Williams Museum, one of the things that Ted Williams wrote or said, I hope that someday the names of Satchel Page and Josh Gibson in some way could be added as symbols of great Negro players that are not here only because they were not given the chance. That was Ted Williams in 1966 in his induction ceremony speech. And I think that true to form in his museum, like I said, they have, it's a nice, there's things on League of Their Own, so wherever you want to see it, it's a fabulous museum too. But back to Buck and the Hall of Fame. And like Wes said, he came one, one short, one vote shy. But the news I was going to tell you guys is that now he's up, he's up for consideration again. And that actually they're going to vote in Florida, in Orlando, at the winter meeting on December 5th. So what they did, and I want to, like I said, Wes did such a great job. I'm just going to explain this briefly. But what the category for Wes, you know, it's all, because they did that huge group, like Wes said, to get, to kind of make a wrong, you know, make, make things right. But best what fits in, what, what, what they call the early baseball era, which is pre-1950. That's the category he's actually going to be looked at for this. But as we talked about, his career spans years and years and years of baseball. The, and I, like I said, I apologize for reading this, but the early baseball era, pre-1950, the golden days, 1950 to 1969, the modern baseball era, 1970 to 1987, today's what they consider today's game, 1988 to the present. So there's these different, four different groups that vote, and like I said, Right now, he's up for consideration again. And I'm hoping, and I'm sure that, you know, probably everybody here does, that he gets in this time. And, yeah, Wes? I was just gonna say, I'm hearing from a lot of people, it's just too much pressure not to get him. So I'm really thinking he's going in, because there's a, at least another 25 guys that belong in right now. You know, yeah. the guy from Jacksonville belongs in there. John Donaldson, I can, I can go on and on. But I'm hearing the pressure, especially from guys like him, there's a lot of heat coming down to get butt in the hall. If you belong, there's people in the hall, not as concerned as you. I agree. You know, Wes, yeah, perfect. And like Wes mentioned, this the Buck O'Neill Award was first given in 2008 to Buck O'Neill. One of the other recipients, Rachel Robinson. So it's given every three years, as far and, and like Wes said, it's a tribute to the people that that did so much for baseball. So it's, it's, it's hard because where do you put Buck? Because he spans all four of the eras that they're considering for the Hall of Fame. That's how long his, leg, that's how long his legacy was. So, like I said, one of the things that, I don't know if you want me to mention this now, camera, but a couple of the items, and, and like I said, I always try to get more space at the museum. I, I keep, every time I come, I say, is upstairs done so I can have more room? Um, one of the things that, I picked up for the museum, and this is an autographed ball from Buck O'Neill. Buck O'Neill, first black coach, Cubs 62. And it has, you know, so it's kind of a nice thing for the museum. And it's signed on a Jackie Robinson 50th anniversary baseball. And an 80th birthday photo of Buck and some of the guys at the museum. And then this is probably, you want me to mention this now, Tamara? Um, what this is, is a Buck O'Neill autograph bat, and it's the Jackie Robinson model. So it, it, this is going into our museum here in Carabelle as well. So it's, what we're trying to do is, is add, and hopefully more and more people will come up and see the museum and check everything out. Yeah, it's, 
Well, I've noticed that it's like when you when you look at it, when you and feel free to pick up whatever you want to come and take a look at. What else? Is it? it is. What? I can't see where it says. Yeah, it just says JR2. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of small, but like I said, this it. And the reason why it's kind of pertinent to have him sign in on items is, like Wes was mentioning, he was the bridge, and it's ironic they have a bridge like Wes said in Kansas City Port. But the bridge, he bridged the gap between Jackie Robinson and Frank Robinson, the first manager. So his role in, in baseball is solidified. And it was, like Wes said, it was a really weird experiment that the Cubs were doing. And then the one place, the camp, if you go to Jacksonville, there is a statue at one of the stadiums, local stadiums there, for a buck. If you go, obviously here, we have to sign yeah. up. You know what I ever say? I'm glad you mentioned that. That yeah. field used to be called a jerky field. Al Lopez played there in 1927 for Jacksonville Tars. And then Buck played for the Jacksonville Red Caps when he was small for And Dick Lundy played at the That's a great historic ballpark. And yeah, they have a statue of Buck. Yeah, so, like I said, I mean, Everywhere you go, there's tributes. Well, the ironic place that there's not, and we were just up here a couple months ago, is the Chicago Cubs. He played, well, he was like the first black coach. He, he was, a, he was there for 30 years. Nothing. Do you know why, Russ? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. No. I mean, it's, it's an odd, it's an odd thing, because Kansas City, actually, there's a video they consider him, like I said, the one that there's a poster that says son of Sarasota, I apologize for that for you guys, but this is a video about, like it's kind of an interview, it's called Mr. Kansas City, The Life of Buck O'Neill. So how much they think of Buck in Kansas City? Sarasota, here. It, it's just odd to me that there's that gap and they, have, they do have a, their own version, the Cubs have a version of, of their Hall of Fame there. He's not in it either, there's 50, about 58 people. The buck's not in there. Including two people who signed. True. At least. Yeah. So, I'll, look, I don't really have the answer for that. It's just something that's, that I found somewhat curious. But, so that was the news I really wanted to present to everybody, is show you some of the items that we're going to decide how we're going to fit in the museum. Um, this is the jersey that, you know, the classic Kansas City jersey with Buck O'Neill. His number 22. So this is one of the things that we're going to have in the, in the museum as well. It's, it's, like I said, it's a work in progress, and I'm proud to be part of it. The other jersey is from the, the Cuban championship team and that he was part of in 46-47. One of the other things that Buck did, and we talked about, I, I thought, well, barnstorming with Buck would be a good title for kind of what we're doing, because as Wes said, they, they travel all around. So if you get a chance, those are some of the, I just want to mention some of the places that they have Buck O'Neill items. Um, but Kansas City, like Wes said, it, the museum is fantastic. And it's what the legacy of Buck is that he would actually, as he was older in life and the museum was set up, he would hang out. And when you come up, you pay your, you pay your money and there's Buck. And he'd say, hey, you want me to give you a tour? So after all these years, he would, you know, he would tour the, he would give you a personal tour and you know you'd see everything that the stadium has to offer. I mean, the ball and the ballpark part is really cool. And it's ironic that Wes said the photo you can see of all the players inside and Buck with his classic stand, stance, kind of like this looking in. And it's kind of ironic, as Wes alluded to, all the guys on the inside are in the Hall of Fame, and Buck is the one on the outside looking in. So hopefully we can get this done, the Baseball Hall of Fame, because even at the time the Commissioner of Baseball, the, the Hall of Fame itself, because they don't, they don't do the selection. That's one reason I think that they tried to do the best they could to make right of this by giving the Buck O'Neill work. When you walk into the, if you walk into the Hall of Fame, the first three people that greet you are life-size statues of Jackie Robinson, Lou Gehrig, and Roberto Clemente. The next is Buck O'Neill. That just shows 
his prevalence. And like I said, the era. Which era do you pick for Buck O'Neill? And again, these items, like I said, we'll, we'll decide. And there are some of the books, if you guys want to take a look. And th these, are, these are some of the writings on Buck. I figured I'd bring them by. Yeah, I was asking you, but that's the one. The one yeah. sold in America, sold in book. Yeah. That, that's one of my two favorite baseball books. I think I read it every Wes is correct. I was going to mention that too. This, if there's one baseball book, no offense to me or Wes, because we both, <laughs> this is the book, because it's the, the solo baseball, a road trip through Buck O'Neill's America. And it goes back to my part of being tra of traveling. And it gives you an idea of his personality. And the grace. I don't know if, if I got snubbed from the Baseball Hall of Fame where I would, I would go and speak on behalf of the 17 that got in. I don't know that my character, I would like to think I would, my character is that strong. That was just Buck O'Neill. And like I said, trem tremendous book. So these are up here so you guys can kind of take a look. One of the things that, ironically, this, is, this was done by the Center for Negro Leagues Baseball Research. And here in the Forgotten Coast, there's a whole series of them. So if you want to look up different players that were in the Negro Leagues, this one's titled Forgotten Heroes, John Buck O'Neill. So here in the Forgotten Coast, and this, this, if you want to read something small that kind of gives you a good, a good explanation of what's going on in Buck's life, it, this is a kind of a synopsis. So I hope one just, and I guess I appreciate your time, but I just want to read this part one more time. That I'm, I'm hoping that in 20, that we, we come back, maybe almost well, come back again next year, July 24, 2020, and maybe we can come out and rededicate the sign, and maybe this time I'll read Carabelle, Florida, home of the Negro Baseball League standout, recipient of Baseball's Lifetime Achievement Award, and member of the Baseball Hall of Fame, John Jordan Buck O'Neill Jr. Thank you guys. That's a great idea, Josh. We really appreciate it. Well, as you all can see, we have definitely um, been blessed with having this man in our lives at the museum and are really benefiting from um, from his activity and involvement with us. He even helped set up chairs yesterday. I mean, he's a good volunteer, uh, along with all of his wonderful baseball experience. Um, I would like to just make a couple of closing remarks and then instead of doing Q and A's, I think maybe you'd like to come up and take a look at some of the wonderful things that uh, Josh has brought up here. Some of the photos are fantastic and a little hard to see from your seats, but. We really appreciate you coming. I think anybody that will come inside on a beautiful day like today has to really be commended for uh, for your priorities. And we appreciate it so much. And David, I don't know if you'd be willing to like take a picture of Josh presenting the bat and the ball to the museum because that's kind of the next, that's one of our, we're particularly excited about, about the, we saved the place for the bat, and now we're waiting for the glove. That's our other thing we've been looking for for all these times. But Josh has just been so generous with his collection and looking out for us and helping us to acquire things that he's loaning us. So we have have that pleasure of uh, knowing that it's going back to a good home in the event anything ever happens to the museum, heaven forbid. But we are thrilled to, um, to have that exhibit at the museum and considered Buck O'Neill to be a really important part of the history of Carabelle. And the next time we get together, I'm going to have a picture of his grandmother's house where he was born. I've spent three months trying to find that sucker, and I know it's existing in the world, but it's, uh, it's eluded me so far, so we're still working on getting that. But thank you again so much for coming today. We appreciate it. Camera. Yes, ma'am. I want to mention Lanternfest. Oh, yes. Um, everybody's always saying, well, what's the next thing going on in Carabelle? So the next thing going on in Carabelle is this Saturday evening after Thanksgiving, uh, the Carabelle, the Griffey River Lighthouse and Keeper's House Museum is hosting the Lanternfest, which is the 
birthday party for the lighthouse. And it, if you haven't been, it's extremely magical because it's at night and there are all these very um, unusual lanterns made out, made into shapes of animals and creatures and stuff and things. It's just whimsical and fascinating. And there's great, they got a great band, Kalabal, if any of you have heard of them. They're, they've come several years and we just love them. And then the dancers from the, the um, Tallahassee Community College are amazing. And they do all this black light dancing. It's just, it's an awesome experience. We encourage you to come. And if you come, I'll get to take up your ticket because I'm going to be sitting at the table taking up tickets with Ms. Kelly back there at the, at the door. And um, today was a, a celebration of Buck O'Neill's 110th birthday, even though we're a week late. But we're just delighted to be able to be here and do this. And we would encourage all of you, the museum opens at noon today. And um, we encourage you, to, if you haven't seen our exhibit uh, that Josh has so lovingly put together, uh, please come down and take a look at it. We'd appreciate it. Thanks so much. Oh, please, would you?